Please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. We're here on case 19 C 83 state of Ohio versus Gail Ritchie. We're here for purposes of sensing today after the defendant was previously found guilty on count two of the indictment on April 4 2022, uh, namely for murder. And uh, before we begin, uh, Ms. Ritchie, um, um, I want to make sure you understand you have the right to be present in the courthouse for these uh, procedures. Um, but uh, uh, we were informed by your counsel that because of the complications that COVID-19 is causing for everyone, including yourself, that uh, you were willing to have this sentencing proceed with you and in fact requested that the sentencing proceed with you being at the Joggia County Safety Center. So is that in fact the case? Okay. Secondly, um, I want you to confirm, can you see me and hear me adequately? I can't, thank you. Okay. Your voice is pretty weak for us, so either pull that microphone a little bit closer or try and speak up as much as you can. Thank you. And lastly, as you know, your counsel is here in the courtroom, uh, so if at some point during the proceedings you felt the need to speak privately with them, uh, you need to let us know that, and um, we'll see if that arrangement can be uh, can be uh, arranged or not. I will speak uh, off the. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And uh, so, if you do need to speak privately with your attorneys, uh, uh, let us know that, and we'll see what arrangements might be possible. All right, so I'm going to begin. Uh, counsel, who will be speaking today on the defendant's behalf? Okay. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley, any reason why we can't proceed uh, this afternoon with sentencing? No, Judge, we're prepared to go forward. All right, and have you had an opportunity to review the pre sentence investigation that was performed by the Probation Department of Jargon County? Uh, we have, Judge. Any comments you want to make on it? The report itself is substantially accurate and complete. All right, thank you. So the Procedure that we're going to follow this morning will be that Mr. Bradley will uh, speak first on behalf of his client. Uh, I will, uh, uh, Ms. Ritchie um, will then have the opportunity to address me or not as she chooses. It will then be the state's chance to make their comments to me. I haven't received any indication that anyone from the gallery desires to speak today. As you may already know, I have very little discretion, virtually none, in doing this sentencing. So speaking at today's uh, sentencing may not be fruitful from that standpoint. Uh, but nevertheless, I don't want to deny someone if they uh, believe they uh, uh, want to speak here today. So you need to get word to us after uh, the defense uh, has an opportunity to talk first. So, with all that being said, I'm going to ask Mr. Bradley if you could proceed. Thank you, Judge. I agree with your characterization that the court has virtually no discretion here. The, the sentence is fixed by statute, and I believe that that's a 15 years to life sentence. Uh, I, th I think that's the only sentence available to the court, so I intend to be brief here. We did file a comprehensive sentencing memorandum that addresses some matters of law, um, provides the court with some additional detail about Gail's life, and uh, that I think would supplement the information set forth in the pre-sentence report. Yes, and I do want to confirm that I have reviewed those materials along with the letters from uh, various folks in support of Ms. Ritchie. Yes, and attached to that pre-sentence report is some 20 or so letters from people that have known Gail uh, through all facets of her life for, in many instances, decades. And they all have taken the opportunity to describe, you know, their, their perceptions of Gail as they know her to be in, in their own unique way. 
but but what you can see is a certainly a consistent theme that she uh, certainly throughout her entire life and and the 30 years since this tragic incident she's led an exemplary life as a mother as a wife as friends co-workers she she's she's been exemplary and <clears throat> Uh, I do want to uh, ask that one person from the gallery be permitted to speak and, and briefly just read his uh, uh, letter into the record. So that I, and I think that what's important here, Judge, is that I single out one person, but frankly, it's really representative of all of the letters that we've attached uh, to her pre-sentence report. So with the court's permission, I would ask that uh, Reverend McAfee, could you come up, please? Yeah, I, I do give permission, and I think this is the appropriate time. Your Honor, my name is Gene McAfee, and I'm the pastor of Faith United Church of Christ in Richmond Heights. Dear Judge Andre, I have known Mrs. Gail Ritchie, whom you are to sentence, for over 18 years. Gail's three children were members of our church's vacation Bible school all during their growing up years. And Gail volunteered in that program, as I know she did in others. I have attended the high school graduation parties of all three of the Ritchie children as well as Evan Ritchie's Eagle Scout Court of Honor. I have also known Mark Ritchie, Gail's husband, for the same number of years and in various capacities. In short, the Ritchie family have been friends of my church for the entire time of my pastorate. In that time and in those various settings, I always found Gail to be a kind, loving, patient, and understanding mother, wife, daughter, daughter-in-law, and friend. I saw these traits in her consistently and abundantly. Were I ever to find myself in any distress and needed someone to turn to, I wouldn't hesitate to turn to Gail and Mark. Deeply religious, Gail has sought to conduct her life according to the dictates of her genuine Christian faith. And she and Mark raised their children with the best values they could find and pass on. Mark's father, Professor William Ritchie, was a member of our church. And when he died in 2014, long before Gail's arrest, I said the following about Gail as part of my eulogy for her father-in-law. And it's hard for me to imagine anyone having a better daughter-in-law than Bill had in Gail. Darlene and Carlin were there with comfort and support to be sure, as often as they could be. But Gail faced the day-to-day -day realities with a strength and courage that in my experience have rarely been matched and never surpassed. Harvey and Nancy, whatever you did, thank you. I have never, before or since, singled out a daughter-in-law for commendation at a memorial service. But when I would visit Bill in his declining years, it was Gail I found by his side, day after day, week after week, month after month, in hospitals, rehabilitation facilities, and in his home. Gail displayed a selfless care that went far above and beyond the, daughters, the duties of a daughter-in-law. She was extraordinarily loving to a person who needed her help. I hope, Your Honor, as you consider Gail's sentence, that my letter has shown you something of the real character of this person 
as she has been for decades. Not the frightened and confused young woman who made a dreadfully wrong decision, but the responsible adult whom society would lose should she be sentenced to prison. Gail has also been a victim of her wrongdoing for nearly three decades, and she will bear the burden of what she did for the rest of her life. I therefore respectfully ask you to exercise whatever judicial leniency the law allows as you pass judgment on Mrs. Gail Ritchie. Thank you, Your Honor, for considering this request. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. I, I just thought it appropriate uh, that this letter really represented, represented uh, people's characterizations of Gail that have known her throughout her entire life. And again, I just think it's important to note for the record that uh, she has led an exemplary life, certainly in the last 30 years, and we would ask that you certainly take that into consideration. All of that being said, we do know that you have no discretion here. Um, I do want to just note for the record that uh, at, at our direction, we have instructed Gail not to make any statement to the court in allocution insofar as she certainly intends to exercise her appellate rights. So with that, uh, I have nothing further to add, and I would thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Certainly as an unintended consequence, apparently I'm told because of technology with Ms. Ritchie not speaking regularly, that is why we're uh, unfortunately stuck with the small picture as opposed to filming the screen. And I'm um, not sure we have a cure for that at, uh, at this point. So uh, I just wanted everyone to know that's what the dilemma is. Okay, um, at this stage, then I will ask the prosecutor to please proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, I, I also had a chance to read through the defense sentencing memorandum along with all the letters uh, in support of Ms. Ritchie. And while I don't know her personally, I have no reason to doubt that she has led a, a good life and has made positive impacts on everyone that she's known. Um, actually, that doesn't excuse what she was convicted of. What she's convicted of, the killing of a newborn, is a pretty terrible act. Uh, in her own words, she admits that this is the second time that this has happened. Um, but again, you know, I'm happy to see that someone who made such terrible decisions has gone on to live a, a good life. But in a sense, you, you know, she was able to live that life because she was able to avoid being discovered for 26 years. So in a sense, she's kind of been living on borrowed time, and ultimately here she has been found guilty, and the law, as everyone has acknowledged, imposes a, a mandatory sentence of 15 years, from, an indefinite sentence of 15 years to life. So the state would simply ask the court to impose that sentence. There is also an additional requirement that the defendant have to register as a violent offender on the violent offender database. I believe the court has that notice. I think the court has to go over the requirements with her that goes into effect if and when she will be granted parole. Uh, we also do note that as of today, she has 48 days jail time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I want to start by uh, thanking publicly the counsel on both sides of this case. It was a very unique and difficult uh, case for everyone involved. They all uh, represented their respective interests competently and uh, earnestly and uh, with great, I think, respect also for the court and the jury and the proceedings. So that uh, I want to make sure you all understand. Uh, I thank you for that. In any felony sentencing, uh, the judge is required to consider the purposes and principles of felony sentencing. Those are set out in the Ohio Revised Code. And um, I want to state for the record that I have considered them including the various factors that the Ohio Revised Code sets out um, um, to make a judgment whether someone's conduct is more serious or less serious in a particular offense. I have reviewed those factors, and there are several that I have to conclude apply 
namely the uh, injury was exacerbated by the victim's uh, age uh, is one of them. Uh, secondly, the victim suffered serious physical harm. Uh, that would apply. And lastly, the offender's relationship with the victim facilitated the offense. So I'm stating for the record, I believe those factors apply. I don't, I didn't find any of the uh, factors making it less serious uh, um, uh, applicable. And I uh, acknowledge the arguments that the defense counsel made uh, about uh, grounds existing to mitigate the offender's conduct, but I don't agree. I also had to consider whether um, I believe recidivism is more likely or less likely. I think here, given uh, Ms. Ritchie's, uh, uh, um, led a, has led a law-abiding life, uh, other than these instances, uh, I have to conclude her recidivism is less likely, and none of the factors make it more likely. So, Gail Ritchie. Um, I'm addressing you, unfortunately, given our arrangements with cameras, you're, I'm not looking directly at you. I apologize for that, but I can't do it. As you know, I have no discretion in imposing the sentence today. The sentence must be life imprisonment with the possibility of parole in 15 years. I therefore could simply impose that sentence and send you on your way. But before I do so, I think I want to make some comments. There are likely many members of the Jaga County community who desire the court to admonish you in some fashion, regardless of my having no discretion in imposing the sentence. As you know, this crime affected many people in this county, particularly in the Thompson Township area, many of whom raised funds and arranged for a proper burial for the little boy and named him Jaga's child because no one knew who he was or where he came from. And so I therefore think the community is entitled to something more than me saying, here's your sentence. So here are my thoughts for you to consider. First and foremost, regardless of your age when this crime occurred, regardless of your sense of isolation from family and friends, regardless of your fear of losing your boyfriend, now husband Mark, regardless of your father's probable condemnation of an out-of-wedlock pregnancy, the choice you made in February 1993 was a terrible one. It's almost indescribable in its sheer awfulness. Unable to face and address your own problems and the unwanted consequences your pregnancy might cause, in my opinion, you took the easy way out. You coldly and efficiently eliminated your problem by disposing of the only one who couldn't defend himself. He couldn't yell at you or berate you like you feared your father would. He couldn't leave you or break your heart like your boyfriend might. So instead, you threw your newborn baby into the garbage bag to make your troubles disappear. You threw that bag into the woods and no, and you believed you hoped no one would ever know. But as we now know, Jaga's child was a real infant, a real little boy. Sadly, we saw his sweet little face in the autopsy photos. I've been privileged to greet nine new infant grandchildren of my own over just the last six years. And Jaga's child looked just like all of them went asleep. He didn't deserve what happened to him. He didn't deserve to be tossed into the bag. He didn't deserve to be left alone in the woods, to be mutilated by animals and dragged into an icy, muddy, dirty road. In the courtroom during the trial, I watched your face as you looked up at his face on the screen in those photos, and I saw your tears, and I believe they were real. It appears to me that the horror of it all finally hit you. He was real, and you had let him down. Instead of protecting him, you threw him away. I know your attorneys have argued we should all remember and consider that you were young and afraid and alone and didn't know what else to do and had no one to talk to. But as the prosecutor mentioned, today I can't forget that you confessed when you were apprehended in 2019 that you had done this same thing to a prior helpless infant. Threw that one in a bag immediately upon birth, the bag then immediately thrown away in a field. 
almost identical conduct to what you did to Jaga's child in February 1993. So I truly struggle to accept the explanation that you were young and afraid and alone. Maybe the first time those factors might explain your conduct, but not the second time. I believe you knew exactly how you could solve your problem with an unwanted pregnancy when Jaga's child came along because you had done it before. I believe you probably were afraid and alone, but you were also experienced in dealing with an unwanted pregnancy. You thought you had a solution, so as long as you didn't seek help, didn't tell Mark, didn't tell your parents, you could make it go away. So to me, it's not that you had no one to turn to. You simply refused to share your difficult situation so you could deal with it in your own way. Thus, calling you a monster who deserves life imprisonment might not be an unfair exaggeration. There are, according to you, two little infants that have been tossed away because you couldn't face your problems and fears as a young woman and find a proper solution. That is indeed monstrous behavior, and you therefore deserve this long prison sentence. But I also acknowledge, as horrendous as your behavior was 29 years ago and more, I acknowledge you've since led a respectable, gracious life. You've raised children, you've helped others, you've volunteered, you've worked hard, and you've counseled persons in trouble. You do have many supporters and friends who have expressed to me your value and merits. A life sentence is a tragedy to them too, and I'm certain it is for your husband and children. So I can't rationalize these two Gail Richies. I won't even try. What I know is this, your wrongful efforts to conceal what happened in February 1993 did buy you 29 years of normal life where you got the chance to get married, raise children, and do some good works. But ultimately you gained that time on the back of a helpless infant whose body you concealed in the woods. Ironically, Jaga's child did more for you than you ever did for him probably. Now, thanks to the good work of Detector Seaman sitting here and uh, former detective, now deceased, Tom Dewey of the Jaga County Sheriff's Department and others in law enforcement, your freedom is over. It is finally time to atone for these awful, unnecessary deeds committed three decades ago. So I sentence you to life imprisonment, life in prison with the possibility of parole in 15 years. As a prosecutor, that we have some technical issues that we have to make sure we address. And counsel, I'm gonna ask this question. As I review, I'm prepared to give the post-release control recommendations, but I don't believe they apply. It does not apply. Okay. So we will finish with this. You will you now have a duty to enroll as a violent offender, Ms. Ritchie. And so this is the notice. As you're being sentenced to a prison term, you must enroll uh, in the violent offender database with the sheriff of the, you must enroll personally with the sheriff of the county in which you reside 10 days after release from jail. You're gonna be required to provide the sheriff the following information, your full name and alias, and any alias you use, your residence address, your social security number, any driver's license number, information regarding the offense of which you were convicted, the name and address of any place where you are employed, the name and address of any school or institution of higher education you attend, the license plate number of each vehicle owned or operated by you or registered in your name, a description of any scars, tattoos, or other distinguishing marks on your person. You're required to provide the sheriff fingerprints and palm prints. The sheriff will also obtain a photograph of you at the time of enrollment. After the date of initial enrollment, you're required to re-enroll annually. You'll have to update and or amend any of the information I've just described that was changed and provided, and provide any additional information requested at the county sheriff's office 
within 10 days of the anniversary of the calendar date on which you initially enrolled. And if you change your residence address during the tenure enrollment period, you're going to have to provide written notice of that change to the sheriff with whom you most recently enrolled, enrolled and to the sheriff in the county which you intend to reside within three business days of the change of address. You are required to comply with all these requirements for a period of 10 years unless your sentencing court determines otherwise. Uh, I expect your residence will be located in Cuyahoga County, so that's where you'll probably enroll first, but if it's not, uh, you'll take care of that then. Eventually, I've got a form here. It'll be provided to you at the jail. I will have signed it, and you will need to likewise sign it. So this tragic story, at least in this courthouse, is over. And uh, Ms. Ritchie, um, your counsel mentioned in the sentencing memorandum, they expect that you will endure your prison experience with dignity and grace, and I hope that's true for you. So unless counsel has anything else. Go ahead. Your Honor, um, since she was convicted at trial, she is entitled to be advised of her appellate rights. Uh, okay. Um, you are, I am advising you, you do have uh, rights to f file an appeal, and I'm sure uh, you can discuss with counsel. Any more detail than that appropriate? Just that if she is indigent, uh, she oh. has the right to. Yeah, if you are unable to afford counsel, counsel will be provided to you at the state's expense. And the transcript at the state's expense. And the transcript will likewise be provided to you at the state's expense if you are unable to afford it, if you qualify. And otherwise, you're under just court costs. Okay, that's right. I impose court costs uh, uh, for this proceeding. Just briefly, one last thing on behalf of the defense judge, we would object to that portion of the court sentence requiring that she register uh, with the violent offender database. As the court's aware, that statute was enacted many, many years after the uh, date of offense at issue in this case. So as a result, we maintain that that violates ex post facto clause of the United States Constitution, violates the prohibition against uh, retroactive legislation set forth in the Ohio Constitution. We also think that that sentence, that con condition of the sentence uh, constitutes a separate punishment and thus violates the jeopardy clause of the Constitution as well. I would just have you uh, note that objection, and for, for whatever it's worth, in uh, anticipation of the court imposing that sentence, I uh, met with Ms. Ritchie, uh, Mrs. Ritchie earlier today and uh, went through the appropriate um, form and had her executed in my presence. Oh, excellent. Your objection is noted, and thank you for providing that.